for being at First Christian Church of Washington. We have a lot going on this week that I want to call your attention to. First of all, this evening, we're doing our birthday celebrations, as you can see up here at 530. And this is a new event to me, as I understand it, everyone who celebrates a birthday, which is everyone, is welcome to be here. It sounds like a lot of fun. There's going to be 12 different cakes, one for every month of the year, and I hear the best one is going to be November. I don't know why, <laughs> November. I hope you will be here. I look forward to it. I think they're going to do hot dogs, and the Living Water Praise Band is going to play some music. It sounds like a lot of fun, so I hope you'll plan on doing that. And then we have two outreach <coughs> opportunities, one that I have to get signed up for myself. Yes, yes, Debbie says. I've got to do that. I'll do that today before the day is over. There is the 6K, which is roughly <coughs> four miles. And this is to help provide clean drinking water to people in India. We take a lot of things for granted, but if you want to sign up for that, you can contribute to it even if you don't plan on walking or running. It's not really a race, but it's an opportunity for us to see <coughs> just how far some folks have to walk in each direction, is that right? To provide clean drinking water. So it's an important ministry that we're able to offer. Also, for some of us, we take our education for granted at whatever level. And there are people who work hard to make steps towards incre increasing and enriching their education and get to a place where sometimes their financial situation can be prohibited. There is an opportunity for us to provide some resources for people who are ready to take their GED, their high school equivalency diploma, to earn their high school equivalency diploma, and, but they've come up to where they're a little bit short financially. So there are 18 students who need the resources to pay for the application and the test, which is $80. And so what we're doing is, for whatever contributions we see, receive from the congregation, as you recall, there was a very generous anonymous gift, and that generous anonymous gift will match the contributions of those that emerge from within the congregation. So if you would like to contribute to that, in the memo line of a check, <coughs> You can place BCCC for Beaufort Community, Beaufort County Community College. Are there any other announcements? Yes. After the 11 o'clock service, we're going to have our luncheon for those 80s and above. So if you are 80 and above and you have not called the church office yet, please call them tomorrow so I make sure I've got enough cake and food and we are having entertainment by River Song Trio. They're going to be our entertainment for the day and I hope to see those of you above 80 there. Thank you. She's looking at me very strongly. I'm not above 80. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't acquired that kind of wisdom. <laughs> okay, I'll try something. <laughs> Other announcements? Um, we had our one day regional assembly yesterday in Wilson. We installed our new interim regional minister, Reverend Ray Warren, uh, who served uh, at the. Uh, that place where that boy down yeah, south is. Ray Miles from from the Georgia region. Yeah. That's right. That's right. I came from Georgia. I couldn't think of it right now. It, it confused me because. Um, they went to all the trouble to remind us he was a Canadian, so he was actually an import. How about that? So I had to stop and think where he really came from then. Uh, anyway, so he looks very much like John Richardson, so if you see him, you'll know him. Uh, so, uh, and we also voted yesterday to sell our regional office, so we will be uh, moving to um, First Christian Church Wilson in some of uh, their space, uh, we think, at this point in time. We sold it to Barton, by the way. We didn't just, you know, pass it on. We sold it to Barton College. They're going to move their maintenance over there so they can add on to their gym. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other announcements? Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Good morning. Good morning. Please stand and join us in our responsive reading. And keep standing for the hymn of praise. Join us on our journey, living God. We have feelings to express, experiences to share. Walk with us on our journey, compassionate God. We have memories to recall, faith stories to tell. Reveal yourself to us on the journey, surprising God. We have thanksgiving to offer, bread and wine to share, and community to nurture. Strengthen us for our own journeys, ever-present God. We have commitment to pledge. We have Christ's work to do. God, we are talking about Peter today, and Peter is gracious. Jesus is gracious. As we grow in him with gentleness, Jesus leads us through difficult lessons of life. He gives us nourishment we need for an abundant physical, mental, and spiritual life. He says, my kindness is toward you always. You were created with a need for me, and I am available to be your fulfillment. Please help us to be fulfilling to others. Amen.
Our scripture lesson is from 1 Peter 17 through 22. If you invoke our, as Father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defects or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now you have that now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth uh, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. Now we welcome our children.
just told Jacob, too bad it's not Pentecost Sunday, everybody's speaking in tongues at once, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> there's, there's, there's gifts and joys that the children bring to our, our moments together. They are, they are truly a blessing. As we prepare for our community prayer, this is our time to share our joys and our concerns with one another. And um, I just want to share with you the joy that I experienced yesterday being at the regional assembly. It's always a blessing to be able to be in worship and in gathering with people from our region who support our church camp and support all the different programs for ministers and minister relocation and ordination. And it's just a gift that we have the region that we do. And that next year in Greenville, go ahead and mark your calendars or we'll, we'll have the dates out soon, that next year's assembly will be in Greenville and it will be the 170th 170 years that we've been the North Carolina Disciples of Christ. So I hope you will be able to join us since it's so close and they're encouraging us to be there for a big celebration. Okay, Miss Ella. I would like to say good morning to the church this morning. My mother, she can't she can see now. She can see good and she can hear good. And I thank the members and all. It's, it's all right. I would like to take the pastor and his wife and you out to dinner one Sunday. It's all right. May God bless all you. May God bless all of you. And I would like to uh, give a donation and help the children, help people that need help. And thank you for your prayers and answers. Thank you. Thank you. I, I forgot one thing. <laughs> I got so flustered over the Canadian. Uh, <laughs> next Sunday afternoon in this sanctuary from four to six, uh, we will be the search committee for the permanent regional minister. We'll be having a listening session. So if you have, would like to have some input on what type of regional minister we uh, are looking for, then please come and join us four to six, right here, and help us search for the right person for the job. And they did request that all, everybody in the region be in prayer for the search committee as they're in this process of looking for a new regional minister. Please be praying for that committee and for our region. Maggie. Morning, um, okay, this week, this Thursday is Bob's surgery and it's pretty major. And I just appreciate your support and prayers. Bob's been waiting a long time and we definitely will be in the spirit of prayer for Bob on Thursday. I just wanna mention this morning that Brett has had his second scan and it again shows no cancer. Thank you. Well, we want to continue to remember those on our current prayer list, um, especially Miss Edna Willard, because she's usually in her spot right in front of us, and she's not able to be here now, but. We, we need to remember Edna in our prayers and her family. If there are no others, let us pause for a moment of silence as we go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning seeking to open our lives to the fresh winds of your Holy Spirit. Guide us that we might be able to know and live in the fullness of your love. Fill our hearts and our lives with song and gratitude for the many, many ways that you give care to us as you walk with us each day. 
We are grateful that you walk with us on good days and on cloudy, rainy days. You're with us in our joys and you're with us in our struggles. We just ask that you'll be with each one in this sanctuary today in the way they need your care. Lord, you hear our prayers, spoken and unspoken, and you meet us where we are, reaching out to us and giving us your grace and your mercy. Forgive us when we allow our worries and our concerns to blind us from recognizing your presence. We pray that you will continue to be with this congregation and with our regional church. Guide us that our church might be faithful to you. Lord, we want to be working with you and be witnesses to others of the coming of your kingdom on earth. Your kingdom that will be filled with kindness and justice for all people. Strengthen us with the gift of mutual love for each other as we seek to truly be your community of faith. Be with us as we unite together in your Holy Spirit, praying together the prayer that Jesus gave us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Each week as we gather around this table to break bread and to drink the wine, we're gathering as this congregation here in Washington, but we're also gathering knowing that there are other churches here in our region, there are other churches throughout the world who gather each Sunday to celebrate God's love. We know that God's love is here in the midst of each one of our lives, and he's here in the midst of this congregation as we witness here in this community. Each time we break the bread and drink the cup, we celebrate God's love with us. Let us renew our spirits and open our hearts to receive that love as we're led in prayer by our elders. 
Lord, our Heavenly Father, we come before you to this table, not by ritual, but by intention. We come to you at this table as one community to commune with you. We come to receive your forgiveness, to receive your power, to receive your glory and your love that we may become your love. Lord, as we take this bread that represents your son's broken body, we recognize that he did this for us in the name of love. Our Heavenly Father, it is your love that we come to this table for, your spilled blood shed for us to show us that you would go to any length to bring us together, to bring us in community. As we take of the cup, let us be ever mindful of your love for us every day. As Jesus gathered with the disciples in the upper room on that night, he took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. In like manner, he took the cup and said, this is the new covenant that is given for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink this in remembrance of me.
This is the cup of salvation given for you. This is our opportunity to give back, to share with others, to spread the good news of God's love beyond these walls. Let us reach out and give so that others might know the joy that we celebrate each day, knowing that God is with us. you are the owner and we are the managers of what you entrust to us. Help us to live for you each day and to generously share the time, talents, treasures, and things you have given us. Amen.
Our next reading comes from the Acts of the Apostles. We'll be reading from chapter 2, a selection from chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, and then picking up with verses 36 through 41. Again, for the context of this passage, the power of the Holy Spirit has been received among the apostles. They were granted the ability to speak in other languages, and people from places all over the known world and in that region were hearing this message proclaimed in their own native language, and there's some misunderstanding about just what is taking place. So Peter is describing for them and, and educating them on what is happening, beginning in verse 14. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made Jesus both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, say, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation, so that all who welcomed his message were baptized. And that day about 3,000 persons were added. May our lives be transformed by the reading and hearing of these words. Amen. We are in the second part of a two-part series on a distinguished community, a distinguished community. Last week, we talked a little bit about what happens in a community of faith. What happens in these buildings that are erected? Oftentimes, we'll see a concentration of these buildings erected in the inner city or in a historical place in the town. For someone who is not a part of a community of faith, I wonder what they think takes place in these churches and in these buildings. What is it that we're doing? When someone drives by on 3rd Street and sees that building with the red roof, what goes through their mind? What is it that they think that we do? When they see these, stone, these stained glass windows, and they probably imagine that the traditional hour on a Sunday morning is 11 o'clock, and they wonder, perhaps, what goes on in this space on a Sunday morning, and how does that impact their lives beyond this hour that we are gathered in worship and in celebration? What does it mean to be a community of faith? How is it that we are distinguishable from other communities? Last week we saw several ways. One of those ways is that we see fundamentally our identity is rooted in our confession of faith. We make a pretty powerful claim. We make a claim that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the anointed one. He is the son of the living God. That statement in itself is so very powerful. We make that acknowledgement, we make that confession wherever we are in our understanding at a given period in time. That's part of what it means to be a member of the church. We recognize as a community of faith that we are an inclusive and expanding community. We saw that last week. Peter stood up and raised his voice. He spoke to people, again, who were from all over the known world and certainly within that region. We heard words and names of places that are sometimes difficult to even pronounce. Serene and Cappadocia and places in Mesopotamia and places, again, all over that known region. They were given the ability to speak in languages that transcended barriers, the barrier of language. The Christian community, the community of faith, one of the ways that we are distinguishable is that we are not known primarily by our nationality. We are not known primarily by our race. We are not known primarily about our political affiliation. We're not known whether we're conservative or liberal. We are an inclusive and ever-expanding community. And then we saw where we are empowered. The apostles were empowered through the Holy Spirit to do something they couldn't do on their own, to speak in a language that they could not have spoken prior to this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Peter was given the courage to speak in the first place. This same Peter who was afraid for his own well-being and hid and denied Jesus and ran. Now he's speaking and we would see if we continue to read in Acts that he was given the ability to speak in the very presence of those who crucified Jesus these words. He was empowered. We as a community of faith, we are truly empowered to do things that we could not do apart from the Spirit of God. These are some of the things that distinguish us 
as a community of faith. Well, today we want to continue with our ongoing understanding of how it is that we are to be distinguished from other communities. Number one, we are not a social club. Let's talk about what we are not as we move into what we are. We are not merely a social club. We, not, we do not gather because we share the same hobbies. We do not gather because we necessarily see the world in the same, pl in the same way. We do not gather because of a similar socioeconomic status. We do not gather because we have the same level of education. We don't gather because some of us like to play cards or some of us like to do something else. We are not primarily a social club. We are, in fact, an intentional community. For some of us who are gathered here this morning, some of us, only a couple I hope, maybe none, but there could have been the case that some came and they really didn't feel like being here today. Would really whether have watched Meet the Press or catch up on a show you missed this past week or have another cup, another cup of coffee. But we are an intentional community. We make the intention. Sometimes it's a discipline. Sometimes we do what we would rather, really rather not do something we don't feel like doing. We are intentional about community, and it is not necessarily a social club. Sometimes the community of faith best, best represented is when we enter into relationships with people that perhaps we otherwise would not enter into relationship with. Jesus called us to love our neighbors and love our enemies and love real and perceived enemies, not necessarily like. We are an intentional community because how many of you know in a human community, intentional community, there are people within those communities that we won't always like. We're not just a social club. We are an intentional community. In a community of faith, one of the things that distinguishes us is that we are not hierarchical in terms of status. We do not celebrate some people at the expense of another. We all have the same status. And we all have infinite and the highest status. In Paul's letter to the church in Philippi in the second chapter, he says that we are to have the same mind in us that Christ had. That even though he was in the form of God, even though he was in the status of God, even though he shared the same rank and glory of God, he emptied himself of that status and rank. He took on human form, but not just human form. He took on the form of a slave. He took the lowest possible form. If God takes the lowest possible form of humanity, what status does the lowest possible form of humanity take on? The status of divinity. God has lifted us all to the highest status. We each have infinite worth. We each have the highest status as children of God. In terms of status, there is no hierarchy in the community of faith. In a community of faith, another thing that distinguishes us is that we are not competitive. We are not competitive as the world understands competition. In the world of competition, oftentimes people excel, excel to a place of status. This is related to a hierarchy of status. When people excel, when people compete, some people are perceived to be great at something and they are assigned a status at being great at something and others who are not as great as those persons do not share that same status. We are called to be competitive in one way. Paul, writing in his letter to the church in Rome in chapter 12, verse 10, he says that we are to outdo one another in showing love and honor. If we're going to compete in anything, we will compete in showing one another the honor each one of us deserves by virtue of being created in the image of God. We will outdo one another in showing love for one another. That's how we compete with one another. Because we recognize in the body of Christ when we have been baptized into the body of Christ, we are one body in many parts. And when one part suffers, all parts suffer. When one part rejoices, all parts rejoice. We engage in great effort to become the people we are called to be because we know that as we grow and mature, as we excel in showing honor and love for one another, the whole body benefits. If we fail to excel in showing one another honor and love, the whole body suffers as a result. We're not competitive in the sense that I'm better than you. If I'm able to excel better than you are, we've all been lifted to the highest status possible. And then finally, and this is not an exhaustive list, one of the things that distinguishes us from the so-called world is we are not people of violence. 
We are not people of violence. Since the days of Jesus, very faithful people have wrestled with how to live out this faith in a faithful way. <coughs> violence takes a number of forms. There is physical violence. There is emotional violence. There is interpersonal violence. There are social groups that commit violence toward other social groups based on race or sexual orientation or nationality. There is international violence. Violence is not merely physical. Violence is when anyone harms the dignity or value of another human being. We are not violent people. Jesus was not a violent person. Our primary identity is through our confession of faith in Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, the one who reveals who God is. And Jesus was nonviolent. Now, I realize that can create a great deal of conflict for us and our relationships as people who are citizens of the United States of America and who may, from time to time, God forbid, find ourselves in an interpersonal situation where we do not know what to do. It is possible that we can be people of love and people who would not commit harm or violence to the dignity of another human being, but sometimes out of love for the aggressor, out of love for an abuser, even the abuser, we will engage in necessary force to prevent them from harming the dignity of another, which compromises their own dignity as a child of God. There are times when we are called to use restraint, if necessary, to prevent one group or person from causing harm to another. And this is what I want you to see. That restraint that we impose on another is even out of love for another. This is where God's justice and God's love is different from human and worldly justice. We see in our passages this morning, particularly in the first one when, that we saw in 1 Peter, we see this discussion of ransom. We see this understanding of the length, as Debbie so eloquently described in her prayer, the length to which God will go to restore broken community. In verse 18 of 1 Peter chapter 1, it reads, You know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors. We were ransomed from our feudal ways. Then in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, it says there, Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. It's important for us to have an understanding of this. Who crucified Jesus, the Messiah, according to this passage? Sinful humanity crucified Jesus, according to this particular passage. This is what I want us to see. As a community of faith, we will do whatever is necessary to restore broken community. There are times even when force is necessary. Let's recall for ourselves some 40, 50 years ago during the Civil Rights Movement. There were folks who were standing up for their particular rights. There was time when the National Guard was called in. And the National Guard was there to be a presence of force if necessary. It was in support of those who were fighting for their civil, civil and human rights. And it was also there to restrain those who would have imposed violence on them, again, thereby harming the dignity of those who were standing up for their rights and compromising their own dignity by having engaged in that behavior. We as people of faith are called to do whatever is necessary to create the potential, to create the circumstances under which healthy and restored community can thrive. One of the things that defines us primarily as a community of faith from all other communities is that we are a community rooted and grounded in love. Now, I realize I use that word quite often. But love is a finite word that we use trying to begin to comprehend an infinite reality. That word love can never fully comprehend the infinite reality of God's love. God's very being is one of love. Now, I want to share with you a definition that I've often shared with you, but we're going to take it just a little bit further this time. Love is that meta value 
It is that meta virtue without which we have access to no other values or no other virtues. Love is the meta value. Where there is not love, there is not justice properly understood. Where there is not love, there is not freedom properly understood. And that's the reason I spend so much time in the last few weeks discussing these atonement theories. Atonement means at one minute. It means to restore broken community. That's the reason it's important that I point out that it was sinful humanity that crucified Jesus, not God. Because sometimes in our minds we think of God's love as one thing and God's justice as another. On the one hand, we understand God to be a God of love. And on the other hand, for some of us, we understand God to be a God of justice who will punish violently someone at the expense of another. And it's hard for us to maintain and reconcile these different concepts of God. What I want us to see is that within God's love is contained the understanding of God's justice. Within God's love is contained the understanding of freedom. God's justice and God's freedom is within God's realm of love. And that's the reason it's important for us to see that God's justice is different from the world's justice. The world's justice, the feudal ways that we have been ransomed from, there was a time when we understood an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But even that was a measure of restraint. That did not mean that you have to take the eye of another if they've taken your eye. It didn't mean that you have to take the tooth of another if they've taken your tooth. It means if they took one of your eyes, don't take both of theirs. If they took one of your teeth, don't take both of theirs. There has to be some restraint in justice. And then Jesus comes along, the one who embodied God's perfect love, and he says, I know that it's been said, pointing to the law of Moses, but I say, who is the word of God? Jesus is the word of God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus says, I know it has been said, but I say, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to them the other also. I know it's been said, love your neighbors, but hate your enemies. But I say, love your neighbors and love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you. In Jesus, we see the justice. God was the injured party, and God took the initiative toward us. God will do what is necessary to restore broken community. It is not that we have to exact a punishment for the crime and to get even with someone who has done something to us. That's the world's justice. That's not who we are. We are about restoring community. We're also about freedom properly understood. I want you to think with me for a moment about the stories and the witness of scripture from Genesis to Exodus and through Revelation. The Israelites needed to be delivered from the Pharaoh's oppression, from Egyptian oppression. Were they free once they were delivered? They were delivered, but were they yet free? They wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years. We, too, through the love of God, have been ransomed from our feudal ways. We have been delivered from our feudal ways. But freedom properly understood is when we are able to unite our wills to the will of God. Jesus was free to lay down his life, and he was free to take it up again. We have become free through the power of the Holy Spirit to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength to love our neighbors as ourselves, and to even love our enemies as God in Christ has loved us. What distinguishes us from all other communities is our ability, our freedom, to be the children of God that God has called us to be. One final word as we close. I want you to always remember that one of the things that distinguishes us as a community of faith is that we are ultimately unstoppable. There is no tyrannical government. There is no religious system. There is nothing that the world can create or devise that will stop the community of God because we are a community of love. The love of God in Christ would confront a religious system that would divide rather than unite. The love of God in Christ would confront a government that would divide rather than unite. It is through the life, it is through the teachings, it is through the actions, 
It is through the death, but it is through the resurrection that we realize that the love of God is absolutely unstoppable. It is the Alpha and the Omega. It has no beginning and it has no end. It is the power of eternal life. On this particular Sunday, it's important for us to recall some things. Three years ago this weekend, the unthinkable happened. The church building that many of you grieve and on this particular weekend are mindful of, three years ago, this is the anniversary of when that church building burned to the ground. But that was not the end of this community of faith. No fire can end this community of faith. God forbid that this church burn down, but if it does, it won't be the end of this community of faith. This is a community of faith rooted and grounded in love, and it will never be able to be stopped. We are a community of faith that puts no status on anyone other than the status that everyone deserves. When we say everyone is welcome here, we mean everyone is welcome here. We do not hoard our resources to us and ours. We'll do what it takes to make sure that people have clean drinking water in Indy. If there is a person who needs an education and doesn't have the resources, we will provide the resources so that they can earn their education. We'll do whatever it takes by the Holy Spirit that is in us, the spirit that animated the very presence of Christ, the love that embodied Jesus. We will do whatever it takes to restore a broken community. So I invite all of you, even as I commit to myself, to respond to the three questions that we have each week. For some of us, it's time to make that confession of faith. It is an acknowledgement. Not to make the confession is deny what really is. God really is love. Jesus really did incarnate God's love. Jesus really is the son of the living God. And love is that which triumphs. Dove is that which saves the world. Love is my personal savior. It is our social savior. It is the savior of the world, love properly understood. For some of us, we've been going this along. We thought that we were spiritual but not religious. Well, we don't have that option once we've made that first confession of faith. We are baptized into the body of Christ. We are necessarily a part of a community. For some of us, it's time to become a part of a community. Each one of us every one of us, we have the opportunity to rededicate our lives. It doesn't, you don't have to come forward, you're welcome to come forward. As we stand, each one of us can make the decision to rededicate our lives to the confession that we made. I invite you to stand and respond as God is leading you to respond.